Thanks so much, everybody. So let me tell you a little bit about Creative Mornings and, and uh, why we decided to start something, but also under the umbrella of this existing organization. Uh, Creative Mornings was started uh, 15 years ago by a woman named Tina Roth Eisenberg, who's actually been uh, become a friend and mentor through this process. Um, and, and so what we actually did is we had to create a video application, answer a bunch of essays, and then submit to see if we could actually start this organization under this umbrella. Every month, over 25,000 people gather in um, hundreds of cities around the world in the context of Creative Mornings. There are actually three chapters in the Ukraine. And, and we never had a chapter here. Uh, it made a lot of sense to start something here, which we can talk more about. Um, but then to do it under that existing umbrella meant that we had access to mentorship. We had access to um, a lot of other resources that we wouldn't have had, had capability to plug into. It would have meant a lot of like tech doing that would have, I think, uh, gotten a bit, let's say, in the way of just what our express purpose is. Um, Creative Mornings is, uh, has its own sponsorships as well, and so I'm obligated to here mention uh, MailChimp, which is the newsletter service that they use. Um, so uh, MailChimp's actually a great tool. I've been experimenting with it recently. So if you have newsletter needs, um, MailChimp is, is for you. So a little bit about what we're doing here, and then we'll get right into introducing Catherine, because I know that's why you're all here. Um, so the goal, I would say, of starting a chapter here is to lift our creative community. And I think this is something that we've all felt in one way, shape, or form. Um, and, and it means different things to different people. When someone asks me, why did you do this? Uh, the answer I give is to lift the creative community. And usually that ends up being a, a prompt for them to launch into their own version of what they think this community needs. Um, and what I've observed is that there are lots of different perspectives, which are all actually quite valuable. but. Um, it, no, one's, no one says to me our creative community is exactly where it should be. Uh, there is, I would say, a restlessness. I would say there's a certain amount of tension. Uh, there's a certain amount of ambition. And it means lots of different things, lots of different people. And I think a lot of what we'll do in this group is explore that. Uh, a lot of people also ask me, kind of, where do you think this is going? And also, like, where do I think this is going you know, for us or for our volunteers? And I would say that um, this is one of the more open-ended projects I've ever been a part of in my life, where I don't exactly know the answer to that question. My wife, Leslie, who's uh, hidden behind the glass right now for some reason, um, <laughs> is, you know, we, we talk about this and we don't know. But um, I think what we first wanted to do was gather a group of people uh, and get to know people and see how it opened doors. Uh, and then the conversations I've been able to have recently um, with a lot of you, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, um, have really been uh, extraordinarily inspiring. And I want to have more of those. So a little bit very briefly about me. We moved here full-time about a year ago. I work in tech in my, uh, in my spare time. Um, you know, a lot of people have different hobbies like golf or tennis or different things. My hobby is things like this. It's community. Uh, and I actually realized that during the pandemic uh, when I picked up guitar and I play guitar every day, but it was way too introverted of an activity for me is what I realized, <laughs> which I respect and admire. But once I started to have to learn like these solos that would take hours and hours, it's like, this is not for me. I realized that and I realized that my hobby actually was, was things like this. And, and it's actually become much more natural for me when I just admitted that to myself, that this is my hobby. And it actually became a lot more natural and comfortable when I just sort of embraced it. Uh, and, and that's sort of the bit of the personal journey that I'm on is, is more and more involvements like this. We have some volunteers, and I want to thank them. These are their faces. This could be you. Uh, <laughs> These, this group of people reached out when we didn't even have a speaker confirmed, uh, when we didn't have an event space confirmed. And, and they just met and they reached out and I am so deeply appreciative of this group. Um, Mike, Olga, my wife Leslie, Rudy, and Danny. So they're around, you'll meet them, um, but I'm very appreciative of what they've done. And we, we do need more volunteers. Um, but I really want it to align to what your area of passion is. Uh, and, and so reach out to me. I'm easy to get in touch with and I'd love to talk to you more. We also have partners. House of Eight Media is Mike's company. Uh, they are an extraordinary video production firm. They're doing all sorts of interesting things. And so please do talk to Mike if, you, if you're in need of that help. Uh, Wave Street. Uh, Rhett and Judy, um, they are allowing us to be here uh, out of the kindness of their hearts. 
And I'm so touched by the fact that we have this space that we just get to be in. It couldn't be better, right? This is amazing. I'm a little concerned we're going to outgrow it. We thought that that would be a problem maybe in six to 12 months. I hope we don't. So we have to figure that out, Rhett. Um, we'll, we'll talk. Um, and then Pearlworks. You have Alora here, who is actually one of the most extraordinary up-and-coming entrepreneurs in the Monterey uh, Peninsula. She runs a remote work studio. It's also a community. And, and so we're doing some uh, collaboration together and we're exploring that. So Alora is in front here. Please do introduce, introduce yourself to her. And then last but not least, our first sponsor is Mercer Advisors. Jessica is in the back. Jessica is a friend. And they are actually the first sponsor to put up um, some, some dollars, some American dollars, to help us run this thing. I'll give you a few caveats. The, our sponsors are not channeled for profit. They are to cover our operational overhead. Um, as we have more sponsors, uh, then uh, we can do more. We can hire professional photographers. Uh, we can pay for a speaker if we have to, though the speakers today were doing this out of the kindness of their hearts. We have, we, I, I have a sense of where we need to get to to run this how I'd like to run it. And we're not there yet, um, but I absolutely would welcome your ideas here. You can scan um, this QR code to get a little bit of a sense of what we're looking for from sponsors, um, and you can talk to me about it. And again, this is just to help us run. All right, let's talk about our programming. So every single month, Creative Mornings has a theme. It's what they call a global theme. Uh, every month, a new chapter is assigned to put forward that theme. They come up with an illustration, an original illustration, and then they write a prompt about that theme. This month's theme is pride. Uh, pride, of course, means lots of things to lots of different people. I think we all think of pride uh, in the LGBTQ plus context, of course. And, and, um, and that's a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I grew up in San Francisco. I grew up minutes from the Castro. Um, you know, this has always been a part of my life. Um, but we decided to take a slightly different perspective. The perspective we decided to take was uh, about pride of ownership, pride of creation. Uh, and, and so we were able to find the speaker, Catherine, who I'll introduce in a second, who can speak to that topic in the absolute most modern sense. Before we do that, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. What I wanted to do is actually choose a poem that evoked pride of, of place. And so I want to read that poem to you. It's a poem called, Where Legends Touch the Tide. In Monterey's embrace they stand, where waves and dreamers sigh where cypress trees, like sentinels, salute the crimson sky. The sea, with tales as ancient as the stars that gleam above, whispers secrets to the cliffs of timeless, boundless love. Mist-kissed meadows play host to tales of lore and legend old, while Pebble Beach, with siren songs, beckons the brave and bold. In this realm where magic dwells, earth and ocean greet, the Monterey Peninsula, where heart and horizon meet. You can open your eyes. This is about pride of place. This poem, it means a lot to me. But it was written by a chat GPT prompt. <laughs> Unlike Clark, I will share the prompt here. This is the prompt I use. I, I had to tweak it a little bit. I had to come up with a couple different things. But this is a bit of a wow for me. And, and I, it, it was not the first one, that, that, the output, but when I read that output, I was like, oh my gosh. And, and this in particular, borrowed from the epic style of the great poetic masters. I, I wrote that. Uh, <laughs> um, but it really, kind of, it really kind of took my breath away. And I, and I see, I, I think it has an impression on you as well. So let me introduce Catherine. Um, Catherine is a Carmel resident. Uh, she is the CEO of Creative Commons, which she'll introduce to you. Uh, she is also a former uh, parliamentarian. And as you will see, she is extraordinarily down to earth. And, and we are so humbled that she agreed to be our first speaker. Um, I've told Catherine that her enthusiasm has turned out to be a bit of a false positive in terms of finding additional speakers of her caliber. <laughs> So we are so lucky to have her today. Uh, getting to know her and working with her to prepare for today has been a privilege for Mike and I. Uh, and so without further ado, I will introduce Catherine Styler. I have been tasked as the inaugural speaker 
with a title of a speech called Pride and Prejudice. As soon as I saw the title Pride, I, I, I had to, I, I remarked to both uh, to Mike and Danny that I had to bring and weave something in to do with Pride and Prejudice. But the title of our talk today is Pride and Prejudice, Protecting Creators in the Age of AI. I really want to thank Mike and Danny for their energy, their enthusiasm. It's not easy to put something like this together, but look at, you know, look at all these wonderful people. Some of the people in the audience I know already, others I don't, but I hope to get to know as we have many more of these events. But the collective theme, as, uh, as Danny said, is pride. And the artwork that you just saw there is um, made for that theme, which I just think is fantastic. So I just want to say at Creative Commons, we pride ourselves on being inclusive. In fact, global inclusivity is one of our three key values. The others are agile leadership and informed intention. But maybe here I should just say something about Creative Commons. When I shared my speech with Danny and Mike, I was kind of, um, the feedback I got was say something about Creative Commons. So here's my opportunity. So Creative Commons is an international non-profit organization dedicated to helping and sustaining and building a thriving commons of shared knowledge and culture. So what do we mean by the commons? It's what we all share together, not only to use for our own ends, but also to help steward for everyone's benefit. Online, the commons is all the content that's not walled off as someone else's intellectual property requiring permission and often payment for access. In the US and in most other countries, as soon as you fix a creative work in tangible form, a book, a painting, a photograph, a blog post, even a message on social media, that work is automatically protected by what we call traditional copyright. All rights are reserved for you as the rights holder and other people must have specific permission or license to access and reuse that work. In the US and many other jurisdictions, that traditional copyright lasts until 70 years after the original author's death. So after that long wait, after that long wait, the work enters what we call the public domain. And then it's finally free to be part of the commons as an unencumbered benefit to all. Creative Commons offers an alternative for people and organisations who want to share their work without the friction of traditional copyright. Our tools are really two types. Creative Commons licences, where you as the copyright holder keep your copyright, but publish it with a licence that gives everyone clear permission to access and reuse your work, requiring at a minimum that they credit you as the author. We also offer a legal tool called CC0 that enables copyright holders to let go of their copyright and dedicate their work immediately to the public domain, not waiting to die, not waiting another 70 years. Why would someone, as I think this was the feedback that I got from, from Danny, I'm like, why would someone want to add their work to the Commons with a Creative Commons license or dedicate it to the public? Why do you want to do this? So there are many, um, there are many great reasons for this. Um, and one reason is it's altruistic. Perhaps you do not seek direct financial reward for your work and you prefer for all to benefit from that without friction. Another is strategic. Perhaps you do seek or rece receive compensation for your creations, but believe that if you share some of them widely and openly in the commons, it will ge generate greater interest in your entire body of work. Another powerful reason to share is that it's just. For example, as taxpayers, as many of you are in this room, we fund immense amounts of public research. Creative Commons works directly with governments around the world to help them require that the results of publicly funded research are shared to the Commons, often with our licences. Citizens should not have to pay to access the research and data they paid to create. 
So together with an extensive member network across the globe and multiple partners, Creative Commons builds capacity to grow the commons and we help develop practical solutions and we advocate for better open sharing of knowledge and culture that serves our public interest. So since 2002, the CC licenses have served as an alternative to traditional copyright, providing a simple, standardised and legal way for individuals and institutions to share freely images, music, research, resort, educational resources, data, cultural artefacts and so much more. Our licenses power open sharing on popular platforms like Wikipedia, Flickr, YouTube, Medium, Vimeo, OER platforms like Khan Academy, Libretex, OpenStax, and scholarly tools and publications like eLife, Frontiers, and much, much more. So Creative Commons is today considered core open infrastructure and a global standard, like the shared protocols and code that make the entire internet work. And we estimate that today, more than three billion pieces of content are shared online using CC licenses and legal tools. However, we do not rest on our laurels. We always challenge ourselves and we can keep how we keep improving our core values of inclusivity and diversity in all of its forms, whether on the team, our board or in our global community. So Pride Month was particularly special to Creative Commons and I was so pleased locally to take part in our local Pride March. I don't know if any of you were there, but it was just, it was wonderful. It was just a wonderful event. And so if you didn't make it this year, put it in your calendars for next year because we know it happens every year. It was such a great event and I just was really pleased to be there. So back to our topic of Pride. Let's learn a little fun facts of Pride. The pride flag is actually in the public domain, which means that we all benefit without being accessible to us all. Extra fun fact that the title of my talk, Pride and Prejudice, the 1813 novel by the wonderful Jane Austen, my all time favorite novel, is also in the public domain, meaning anyone could read reuse, build upon, creating new creative works and content, which we all can enjoy. So being in the public domain, or some call it the commons, means that Pride and Prejudice is out of copyright and can be freely used, remixed and adapted. We'll talk more um, about copyright uh, shortly. So let's first take the theme Pride. Originally from Old English and Norse, first appearing in the 12th century, it can mean both self-respect feeling pleasure, joy, delight, fulfillment, sense of achievement, self-esteem, dignity, self-worth. Yet another view, which is also true, is a different interpretation of feeling you are better than other people, which feels completely opposite to feeling pleasure or joy, delight. Like one of the lead characters in Austen's Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy. When I say that name, Mr. Darcy, I don't know for many of you in the audience, but I just think of Colin Firth in the BBC uh, series. I just can't help it. And I think some of you know the scene I'm talking about um, from that BBC series. But um, that, uh, and also, I just uh, now that you've uh, reacted like this, um, my director of communications thought I'd better ask you all if you knew about the novel Pride and Prejudice. And I think all of you from that reaction do. So I think this is, I'm, on a, I'm in good territory. But what does pride mean for you? Are you a Mr. Darcy or are you an Elizabeth? Are you a proud parent or an aunt and uncle? Do you think about pride before a fall? Is pride for you something you take in your work? Or do you think like Jane Austen that pride could also lead to prejudice? So if I ask you, um, what do you think? Do you think pride is a positive or negative word? So in the audience that we have in front of us, how many of you think of pride positively? Fair majority. How many of you think it of negatively? That's interesting. Isn't it? And maybe, maybe who thinks of it both? Okay, right, that's, that's fair. Yes, yes. But is, I think it's fascinating how a word can mean one thing and another thing, and how it changes over time as well. I think it's just quite fascinating. Then I was going to ask you, 
Do any of you want to share any examples of things that you're proud of, proud of achieving, proud of doing, proud of being? And I'll just, yes, go for it. What's your name, Mark? Mark. Great, Mark. Thank you. for. I sometimes feel a little uncomfortable about being that proud of him. First of all, he doesn't like it. He doesn't <laughs> want me to talk about him, so he's not here. And nobody tell him. <clears throat> Uh, but secondly, because it makes him feel uncomfortable around his friends, it makes maybe makes other people feel uncomfortable around because they have children too, and oh, this guy is just over overboard about his kid. I mean, and then they listen to the single, and they're like, oh my god. And so, you know, it's justifiable pride, um, objectively speaking, I have to say, with no subjectiveness involved, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, is it always positive? I don't know. Mark, thank you so much. Can we thank Mark for sharing that story? Thank you, Mark. That was, it's always good to have a willing volunteer when you're asking questions like this. So, back to the topic. If we can be recent or from the past, let's together think about what we are talking about. Um, we can see old and new interpretations of pride. Jane Austen saw this when she compared vanity and pride in the novel Pride and Prejudice. And I'll quote from her, because I love quoting Jane Austen. Vanity and pride, she said, are different things. And maybe this really is to what you, what, maybe this is kind of actually really good that you said this, Mark. Vanity and pride are different things, though. The words are often used synonymously. This is, this is her quote. A person may be proud without being vain. Pride relates more to our opinion of ourselves, vanity, to what we would have others think of us. She also looked to truth with her famous first line. Not sure this, well, anyway, it was her version of the truth, and you see that often just now. It is a truth universally acknowledged, she said, well, in her book, that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Now, you may dispute this truth, but this is what she observed in 1813. So today we see pride in a plethora of different ways, including celebrating diversity, rejecting prejudice. Um, and as we look now to artificial intelligence through our own individual lenses, we can see a threat and an opportunity for creativity. Do we see our own pride and prejudices when we consider this topic? AI is turning our world upside down with magic, mystery, excitement, and fear. On one hand, for some creators, they feel AI is stealing their works. When AI models are trained on their works, on the other hand, many creators are creating new forms of art, as we just saw earlier, using AI. So how can we reconcile these two groups, protecting creators, but also enabling creative innovation and discovery. When, if you stop and think about it, all creativity is built on other creativity. All knowledge is built on other knowledge. So for creators, whether it's artists, authors, scholars, filmmakers, musicians, and more, who are a very diverse group of different people working in different mediums with different voices, there appear to be various themes emerging, which I'll break into three groups. Consent, choice, and compensation. Firstly, consent. Many creators want to consent to their works being used to train or not train on AI. And this falls under copyright law which allows for training, regardless of copyright, under what we call fair use in the US, and exemptions and limitations in the EU. And I, I was, uh, again, when I first wrote the speech, I hadn't gone into the detail of that, but I just think you might find this just interesting. Exceptions like fair use are when you can use a work without triggering its copyright. For example, when you quote a small part of another person's published writing, you do not need to ask for a license. Imagine how it would hamper the production of knowledge if we had to. But some creators do want AI tools to ask for a license before using their work in training. And so these creators object to AI training as a fair use of their work. Secondly, creators want choice. 
Like the CC licenses, which provide a range of choices of legal sharing, many creators feel they want a choice both in consent but also in choice. Some may want to allow their works to be used in training if AI tools were in the public interest and not held by private companies making profit. Thirdly, compensation. Many creators today are not fairly rewarded for their efforts or creation. And this is even before considering AI. So how do we ensure fair compensation for creators whose works are used in AI training? Then we have incredible, the incredible possibility of building new commons, for AI, a new commons where AI creation is forming new forms of art and those that are generated by AI are not copyrightable. Last Friday, in, a, in the, the most recent US judgment on copyright, um, the judge in the Tyler and Perlmutter case last week said um, this, copyright is designed to adapt with the times. Underlying that adaptability, however, has been the consistent understanding that human creativity is a sine qua non at the core of copyrightability, even as that human creativity is channeled through new tools or new media. Human authorship is a bedrock requirement of copyright. So when asked the question whether a computer system is eligible for copyright, the judge has said no, because it is not a human creation. Human authorship, remember, is the bedrock requirement currently of copyright. So how do we protect our human creativity whilst not losing the benefits of new creativity? And as I said in my keynote last week in, at Wikimania, its global conference for Wikipedia uh, members, here's the challenge. AI can be exploitative as we've seen in the training of facial recognition models, when AI trains and photos of human faces published on the internet, like those pictures you just shared on social media, it's shaped by all the biases already inherent in the photos and textual descriptions of them. For example, ask AI for an image of a chief executive officer or athlete, most often the result will be a man. But used differently, AI has the potential to build a commons unimaginable when Wikipedia and Creative Commons were first created over 20 years ago. So how can we build this new commons, but at the same time ensure creators are fairly rewarded? How can we support new forms of art and expression which AI is enabling? How do we embrace change with our new AI worlds are generating, but create guardrails through global consensus? How do we minimize the harms of AI whilst reaping the benefits, and in my case, the benefits that means for the commons. So, as you have all seen this morning, many people are using uh, ChatGPT, and I wish I'd created a poem rather than, but, but my prompt was to ChatGPT. How do we minimize the harms for AI creators whilst reaping the rewards? A much less uh, you know, interesting prompt than, than, than Daddy's poem prompt. But what was fascinating was what it created in terms of what the problem is and how we solve it. And many of the things, I'm, I'm, there was about 12 things that it spouted out. But here's the first part. It said, minimizing the harms of AI for creators while reaping its benefit involves a combination of ethical considerations, responsible development, and proactive policies. So it goes through all of them, but maybe I can just touch on a few. Transparency and explainability. These systems often and are often closed. We need to have things transparent and explainable so that those systems can be held to account. We also need new regulation and governance. That was another point that came out. And interestingly, the place where this is happening currently is actually a place that I'm very familiar with, the European Union. In the EU currently, there is a thing called the EU A Act that it's working its way through the legislative process and now it's its final stages. It's what's called a trialogue. It's a trialogue negotiation. If some of you are familiar with GDPR and what that's done to data regulation across the world, the EU AI Act is going to be similar. And I think a lot of it, um, as the negotiation is, but it's going to create rules which are about empowering 
public interest, but also trying to minimise harm. I think it's fascinating this happening. Again, the EU is leading on some of these issues, whilst other jurisdictions are not. And so watch that space when this piece of law gets to a stage where it's going to be implemented. And I think it's going to create some interesting issues, but also I think it's going to create um, a system where AI will be regulated. And that's something I think many folks really want to see. So by um, looking at um, how we think about these issues, as I come towards the end of my talk, and thank you for bearing with me, um, we can think a little bit more about how you think about the analysis. So, we heard what Chad Chibiti said about ethical considerations, consent, governance, these types of issues. Is there anything in your minds that's missing? Is there anything that you're thinking about in terms of credit, compensation, how we ensure that creators are awarded? Are there, are there, are there anything that we are missing in this conversation? I was going to take another poll, but... I, you are my pole, and I can do this towards the end. Is there anything that you think is missing? At the moment, you probably... Well, actually, there, I'm going to be fair. There are those out there in many of the AI companies thinking about this at this moment and are thinking about systems. There's also a big debate at the moment about opt-in and opt-out systems so, and how you could do that practically. So you don't want your stuff to be used, then you opt out of it. So it's, there's, there's a huge discussion. But no one knows what it, how it, things will work. And coming from a commons perspective, We've always thought about people opting into systems rather than opting out of something. And so there's, there's again, a tension. Anyway, I'm going to quickly conclude by saying <laughs> we live in interesting times. And the times are certainly changing. And with this, how we see creativity and human-generated uh, works. We know that... Um, I'm sorry, computer-generated works. We know that we need to approach this with, without pride or prejudice, but as a challenge and an opportunity. Just like Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy, the journey will have its ups and downs, and the story will develop just like the novel. But the ending, as things currently stand, is not clear. And as daily events change and develop, we will see different challenges and as these court cases, as I just described, work their way through the system, uh, possibly change in legal regimes. What I do know is that we need more events like these to develop and explore these topics, which Kate said she's not an expert, but we all are affected by these new changes and new technologies, and we all are interested uh, to know more. So I look forward to the conversation ahead. I look forward to getting to know more of you. And thank you for allowing me to be your inaugural speaker. It's been an absolute delight. And uh, if any of you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. So thank you. Um, I just want to thank Catherine for coming here. Uh, the idea that in our community we could have someone who just a few days ago provided the keynote for the Wikimedia conference, and now she's at Wave Street Studios. So we're humbled that you're, you. that you're willing to do this, and it sets us off on such an incredible course. So again, to Catherine. Awesome. I don't know if there are any other uh, questions for her. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for your, oh, your conversation and, and talk. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Sure. Um, my name is Lisa Berkeley, and I wear multiple hats, but in per this conversation, I'm the co-founding director for the Center for Applied Values and Ethics and Advancing Technology, which is at UC Santa Cruz. And I'm very happy to see Jennifer. And I'm looking at you, and I'm, remind me your name again. Sean, thank you. And Sean. Um, and so um, one of the questions I have, though, is how do we tie all of this into the DEIB or the Diversity 
uh, in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. When we look around the room, it's a pretty homogeneous group, and it really concerns me about what's being used with AI. And so, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Thank you. I think that, um, so how, how are we going to change these systems? And um, one of the things that, um, I think it was back, at, but it was before I started at Creative Commons, was the whole issue of uh, facial re AI and facial recognition. And the biases that, and there are still biases. Because if you think, I just talked about the public domain. What, what, what is this stuff being trained on? It's not going to be, you know, some of it is, Yes, clearly it's web scraping and all of that. But when you th actually think about some of the things that this stuff is trained on, it's stuff in the public domain. And some of that is very old, with old viewpoints and old biases. And so I think first that you need transparency about understanding systems and explainability. I secondly think you definitely need regulation. And I think good governance has to happen with some regulation over how these systems are applied because the systems, I just I have to say, I just completed a no code machine learning AI for data science course at MIT. It was a three month, it almost killed me because I have never done so much maths in 30 years because I, it was just really tough. But I did it because I wanted to under, I can talk about policy, I can tell you what's happening and all of these things, but I want to understand how these systems actually work. And so many of these systems, it's human. It's humans making decisions about what, what data goes in. And as they say, garbage in, garbage out. So I think transparency, accountability within that, I do think we need regulation. And I do think we need better governance models. Um, I was asked um, this week to be part of a World Economic Forum group on AI. And um, they're going to be meeting in uh, San Francisco in November. And I'm part of looking at kind of the technical measures side of things. There's three working groups. So I'm quite excited about that. It's bringing civil society business together. I think we need that. Um, but how do we get global rules? That's the, that's, the EU is going off to regulate. The US is, is behind at this moment when it comes to AI regulation, although they're saying the right things. So how are we going to square this circle? I think it's a huge challenge, and I wish there was better global rule setting. But I think maybe something like this AI alliance with the world economy will help try and drive some of that. But I, I'll thank you for your question, Lisa, and thank you for being here. Does anybody have yes. Probably take two more just to respect <laughs> people's time this morning. Yeah, no, that's okay. Hi, so uh, my, my name's Douglas. Uh, uh, I'm a... Uh, I've recently joined the workforce as a software engineer, so I've been thinking a lot about uh, how AI is being used, you know, dabbled with it a little bit in my career, but um, I'm wondering how that, that might affect if there's just a person asking, asking AI for uh, a, a picture or, or text or whatever, if that is going to try and satisfy that person's expectations and not have unexpected input from someone else's uh, lived experience and, and how that, that might... Do you see that being taken into account for uh, this sort of transparency and um, the accountability for, for the way that AI is being used? Thank you, Douglas, for that question. I think there needs to be more of it. It was interesting. There was a, there was a study at Stanford about with the main AI companies about whether they would actually be able to abide with what is being suggested currently in the EU AI um, reg, 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 regulatory process. And not many of them would be able to abide by it. And I think this is the whole issue about how do we get these systems that are accountable without folks thinking nothing is accountable. And so I think there's something there about accountability, explainability, as I said before. But, um, but if we don't understand how these systems work, how do we hold them to account? When even the heads of some of these companies are saying, I can't explain how it did this. Now, I think this is fascinating, but it's also a challenge. And we have to get the regulatory environment right, or else you go down one route and it stifles innovation. Another route, it could, it, it's just a free for all. So how do we get that balance? And how do we agree, as I said previously, about a global set uh, of rules that, that companies can abide by, but are actually practical and implementable? Um, 
But thank you for your question, Douglas, and thanks for being here. So I think we're going, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. No, but I think we're all excited that people like Catherine are involved in these conversations. So again, thank you so much, oh, Catherine. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're kind of at the point where we're going to be concluding our program. Um, just a few more things before we, before we say goodbye. So we actually do know the date, at least, of our next three events. So take a picture of that. Um, I'm actually in the pro we're in the process still of securing a speaker for September, um, and as you can see, Catherine sets an extraordinarily high bar, and this has given me a lot of confidence to be very, very, very selective. Um, but we do know that who, who will be coming and joining us in October and November. Um, we're going to have Jeanette uh, from the Big Sur Land Trust. She's the CEO of the Big Sur Land Trust, and if you like me are interested in uh, environmental sustainability, um, sort of the future of Big Sur the day-to-day -day kind of transactions and conservational happenings that are happening with Big Sur, we'll be speaking to that. I think it's an extraordinary topic. Um, we will probably not talk about AI in that topic. Uh, uh, and, then, and then we'll have Zach Weston, who comes from a, a pretty well-known family uh, of photographers. And so we, that's where we kind of will get back a little bit to talking about um, you know, uh, photography and, and generative AI and things like that. So it's a little bit of what to expect. And then something we'll also be doing is just giving folks a taste of where we are in the community, uh, sort of where to find us or some community events to be involved in. I want to call out one in particular uh, that is actually a project that Mike Buffo is involved in. Um, it is a, a, a film debut of a documentary about Carmel. And, and it, it is on September 2nd uh, at the Monterey Art and History Association Stanton Center. Uh, and also at that event, um, Mike will be talking about a project that he's personally involved in, which is the restoration of the Flanders Mansion, which is an extraordinarily ambitious project um, that Mike has really inspired me to be uh, very excited about and something he's about to kick off. So of, of these, I absolutely encourage you to, to think about going. I think it'll be um, one of the most interesting kind of happenings in this area over the next few years. And that's it. So thank you very, thank you very much for being here. We have more coffee, we have more bagels.